Some people don't have to worry about where their next meal comes from. But these food supplies won't always be so reliable. Nearly 800 million people around the world are chronically undernourished. Yet this is nothing compared to what may be to come. By 2050, there will be 2 billion more people. Food production will need to increase by 70% to meet demand. By then, climate change could have increased food insecurity to disastrous levels. Its effects are already being felt by farmers around the world. But solutions are being developed to help them adjust to new conditions so they can feed a growing population as climate change intensifies. I'm Doni Kanile in South Africa to meet farmers taking to space to boost agricultural yields and to find out about an extraordinary plant that could hold the secrets to creating crops that can survive droughts. And I'm Gilary Darabi in Nepal, where a team of plant doctors are helping farmers fight the pests threatening to wipe out their crops. We're travelling close to the Tiwata Sluov Dam. This is our major dam that supplies water to Cape Town. But also a, a large part of the water is reserved for irrigation. Normally you won't see this. This is the old trees that used to be next to the river before the dam was built. Now they've been underwater for, for close to 30 years now. And, and this is now the first time that they've really been exposed. This is really severe. It's estimated to be the worst drought in 100 years. Normally we expect that the dams fill up in, in winter and then we can bring them down to about 50% by the end of summer and then they can fill up again to 100%. But it hasn't happened for the last two years. So year upon year they're not filling up in they're winter when the up. rains come because they're just not enough rain. Not enough rain. So, so we won't ever go back to the good old days, if I can call it that, when there was ample water available. The majority of South Africa's farmers are smallholders and their crops are rain-fed. So when weather patterns are disrupted, it can have a devastating effect on their yields and livelihoods. Thomas Ngata is one such farmer living in the Boerland region. He has a small herd of goats, a few pigs, and is hoping to grow some guavas this year. But when I visit, his rain-fed reservoir is almost dry. Mm. Manje baninga abantu la South Africa baninga abantu mshabeni. So dingu tismane si fu ya kakul, gu tisfide wongo mdu. Kuzo enza gaganja niku nye kumvula. Kuzo mshelo wama. Kari ndo tiye ngosi esi tanda zela ya makunga binjalo. Since the 1990s, South Africa has lost over a third of its farms, largely due to water scarcity. As the droughts become more severe and the boreholes dry up, farmers like Thomas are going to need a radical solution. Professor Jill Farrant at the University of Cape Town is hoping to provide just that. Jill's research focuses on a kind of plant with some extraordinary properties. And she is ideally situated because one type grows wild in the hills just behind the university campus. This is, it looks dead, doesn't it? It does. But it's not. It's actually, it's dried, it's lost all its water, and it's curled, it's, it's Front into a very protective kind of way. How long can it survive like this? Ah, oh, months to years, depending on the species. And the moment it rains, this thing will rehydrate within two hours. Within two hours, two even hours. after years? Yeah, after years. Wow. I've got one species, we kept them dry for 10 years. Five hours later, they were alive. I'm trying to unlock the secrets of how these plants can actually lose all that amount of water and not die. So once you understand these plants better and unlock those secrets, what do you do with those secrets? 
I make crops do the same thing. That's my intent. Jill takes me back to the lab where her team is busy unlocking the secrets of these so-called resurrection plants. I want to put this on, on here okay. and then start the rewatering process so that you can see this magic of resurrection. Okay, so we just water the, the roots? The roots, but also give the leaves a little bit. It's like rain. Try and simulate rain. And the thing about farmers in Africa is that they all, all the agriculture is rain-fed. So those who can afford irrigation, great. But if there's no rain for the bulk of us, there's no crop. And the nice thing about this type of crop is that it will start off well if there's lots of rain. It will continue well if there's lots of rain. But should there be a drought, the plant won't die. When the next rain comes, it will continue growing. The farmer can at least get a harvest. Mm. And you can get another chance of life, as it were. Dr. Farron's team's first objective is to understand what gives these plants their unique properties. So what we did here, it was like we extracted some of these proteins from one of the resurrection plants and we transferred these genes to the bacteria. So now we are trying to produce these uh, proteins in a large scale. So these proteins are part of the plant's arsenal to protect itself against the lack of water? Correct. Right. That is this little protein that we're looking at. Okay. In water, it has no structure whatsoever. As the plant's drying, the water molecules are disappearing, right. but this protein then folds and traps a whole lot of water mo molecules ah. inside it. So it retains its, its water retaining by the water. changing shape? Correct. Right. Very intelligent system. You and I can run away from our challenges. They can't. They have to face every stress of their life, which is us eating them, insects eating them, fungi eating them, weather, salinity, hail, all of that. Mm. And they, they have these amazing ways of just recovering and responding. It's done its thing. Oh, wow. Yeah, look, it's resurrected. Oh, wow. It's amazing to think that the plant that we saw earlier that looked dead, basically, now yep. looks completely alive. And I'm just picturing a farmer's field where the maize is completely dead because there's been a drought season and then the rain finally comes again. And the next day it will look like that. The potential of that is staggering. The most promising crop for achieving resurrection is teff, a popular cereal throughout East Africa. But Jill's team recently had a big breakthrough. They were able to prove that the genes responsible for the regeneration process are already present in all plants. This gives a lot of hope for future drought-tolerant crops. For me, the important thing is to be able to leave this planet knowing I've started a process that can make a difference. Mm. A difference in Africa, the continent that I grew up in, the continent that I love. With long dry seasons and unpredictable rains, farms that can afford to irrigate their crops. Almost two-thirds of South Africa's total water requirements are used for irrigation. But in times of drought, severe restrictions are put in place, forcing farmers to become smarter with their water usage. The DeWitt family orchard, just outside Cape Town, produces around 70 million apples and pears each year and exports their produce around the world. Oh, Danny. Nice to meet oh. you. All right. Sure. Thank you for having us. No, pleasure. Pleasure. To ensure their orchards and business survive, the Davids need to be more precise with their water usage, and they are now able to call on a high-tech solution. So one of the new technologies we have is satellite imaging of our orchards. This is what it looks like. It's called Fruit Look. Fruit Look is a precision agriculture tool that helps farmers grow more with less. It analyzes satellite images, meteorological data, and available local data sets to provide near real-time accurate information about crop health. A satellite image can view crops in different light spectrums. The pixels can then be analyzed against crop models to identify a stressed crop before you can even see it with a visible eye. Farmers can react more precisely and quickly to any possible problems. So what does, what does the information tell us about what's happening on the farm right now? Here we can see there is, is a U-shape that is growing a bit weaker than the other ones. Which is a bit... So the, the yellow patches mean that that's not as good growth? Yes. Okay. I think we should go have a look. Okay, we so we can go see what's actually happening there. 
Fruit Loop can give you the early warning signs, even before the watches start showing. In my dad's generation, this was unthinkable. This is the watch. That's fine. It's, its next irrigation is scheduled quite soon, yeah. so it should be fine. So that should be yeah, fine. Yeah. So this part is okay. So we've got this to keep looking okay. and see where the problem is. Yes. That isn't doing as well. A little further down, we test the soil again. You can see this is much more clay soil. It's, it's more yellowish. The holding capacity of the soil yeah. is weaker. Right. Yeah. So what will you do to make sure that this can catch up to some of the other orchards? On the next round of mulching. Yeah, definitely. We'll put some extra mulching here again. Yeah. More mulching allows for water to be held around the roots of the tree. Simply increasing irrigation would waste water as it drains off in the clay soil. Knowing this helps Paul manage the use of water more effectively in his orchard. Ten years ago, you would have been happy with 50 tonnes per hectare. Our aim is now 80 to 100 tonnes. And it's just good farming practices and this new technology that's coming in to make us capable of more precise farming. Twisted. It's better to not pull it because then you get too much of that stem coming off with it. So yeah. if you want to get a clean break, you lift it up and yeah. over instead mm. of pulling it down. It's incredible to think that the pears that we pick here today will be shipped all over the world to China, to the Middle East, and that the farmers, the workers who work here, are making food that will be eaten all over the world. It's important work that they're doing. Fruit Look is enabling farms to reduce their water usage by around 30%. Its successes have led the Agricultural Department of the Western Cape to offer Fruit Look for free to farmers in the region. Only those with the technical means to access Fruit Look are able to benefit from it, however. Thomas is installing some basic irrigation on his farm. This gives him some hope for the future. Mm. Mm. Satellite data is being used in many ways to enhance food security. To forecast rice yields in Southeast Asia with 85% accuracy. To understand how best to grow food in South America by mapping cropland across the continent. To help African herders identify grazing areas through maps sent on mobile phones, thereby halving herd mortality and to monitor the status of all Nigeria's crops on a monthly basis. We know more than we ever knew, and we have an understanding of our planet as a closed system that we didn't have before. We have a new generation of satellites up there that have a resolution of down to 10 to 10 meters. Today, for example, I can give you with seven days accuracy a complete picture of the planet with every single tree on that. So all the information you need is there, but you really need to get it down to the farmers. Most of the food that is being produced on this planet is actually produced by smallholder farmers, farming families. Now these people learn farming on the basis of traditional knowledge. Now, if the weather patterns are changing, as they do because of climate change, then you need a source of information to adapt what you are doing. And in that, mobile technology offers us unprecedented possibilities. There's virtually no space where you couldn't reach the farmers and closing this gap between big data and small farmers, that's one of the very promising approaches.
There is nothing that defines the interface between natural resources and human activity like agriculture does. There is no other sector that is employing more people than agriculture does. So if we get this sector right, the potential is enormous, not only to secure food production, but really to secure the natural environment that keeps us alive. Warmer climates and a greater movement of people and goods around the world are posing a new set of challenges for farmers. Pests and diseases are also becoming more globalized, causing 40% of all crops to be lost each year, threatening the livelihood of smallholders and also posing a great risk to global food supplies. Here in Nepal, almost all fruit and vegetable plants are susceptible to attacks by insects. And with two-thirds of its population in farming, new pests and diseases could spell disaster. What is it about Nepal's climate that makes it particularly vulnerable to these pests and invasive species? Uh, well, we see that globally this, uh, there is definitely an impact of the climate and Nepal is not an exception. So earlier it w was that not too much of a trade was happening between the countries. Now the trade is happening, so more products coming, so definitely more pests coming. And the climate here is now getting more suitable to the pests. It catches the farmers quite sudden and they are not able to know how to cope up with it. If you see last year in 2016, the tomato crop was almost affected by 70 to 100 percent in some farms. So it was a huge loss to the farming community. To help farmers lose less of what they grow, a global program called PlantWise have set up a network of regular clinics to rapidly diagnose pest problems for smallholders. I'm checking out this morning's mobile plant clinic, which seems to be already pretty buzzing. Today is in Hamza town just outside of Pokhara. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is every insect. Oh, it's everywhere. Oh, it's, it is uh, this uh, insect is seems uh, in most of the crops. Quite common in uh, in, say, in fruits, vegetables. It is quite common in insects. So a lot of farmers are dealing with this problem. Yeah. How exactly does the plant clinic work? Plant clinic is an effective program. It is an effective way of uh, giving service to the farmer uh, by uh, direct observation, direct to sample, uh, seeing the sample. We recommend it to the farmer and uh, effective uh, precaution to the farmer. Okay, so they bring in their samples, yeah. they show you the infected yeah, crops, see, yeah, and you can give them a diagnosis right away. Yeah. Just like a a doctor, when you go and you're not feeling well and he writes you a prescription, you're doing the same thing here. You're writing a prescription for the farmer. I will send the message from this tablet, and the name, name of the disease, and the recommendation will be sent to his mobile. And it will be easier for him for the next time also. How much would you say climate change and warming temperatures have affected outbreaks and pests in Nepal? Are you seeing more and more cases? Yeah, we have uh, seen many, many cases and uh, many uh, new uh, insects are pests has uh, arrived. Uh, insects develop the uh, resistance to pesticide also. Rajinda is a local smallholder who has discovered a larvae that has infested and damaged his tomato crop. <laughs> So the senior officer is just taking a quick look, but you can see his crops are badly infested. Oh, there's larva. Yes, it's the larva is too. This uh, is the black, uh, black margin uh, inside uh, the head. Uh, this is the sign of tuta absolute. His entire tomato crop is, is damaged now. Yes. In just 10, 15 days, it's destroyed it. Yes, yes, very, very infected plants. Rajinda is added to the clinic's database to track the tuta absoluta and waits for his prescription. Tuta absoluta started life as a larvae that eats the tomato fruit before transforming into a moth and moving to a neighboring plant, where the cycle starts again. 
It has recently been reported in Nepal and has spread rapidly, devastating crops. I want to find out more about this invasive species, so I'm going to meet Dr. Bajracharya, a Tuta Absoluta specialist at the Nepal Agricultural Research Council. What are you working on over here? Yeah, we are working on uh, South American tomato leaf miner that is called Tuta Absoluta in our scientific name. This was the major pest from 1960. Uh, that confined to South America only, but in 2006, it was reported from first time out of the South America that it is from Spain. Then it came to the 2010 in Iraq, and from 2014, it was reported in India. Wow. After that, because of the open border and lack of weak quarantine system between Nepal and India, uh, this uh, pest came Nepal from the imported tomato from India. So how many years do you think it's going to take until Nepal is completely tuta absoluta free or has really diminished the invasion? Uh, actually, it's very difficult to get rid of this pest once it is introduced in Nepal. Uh, no pest can be we'll completely eradicated. We can completely eradicate any pest, but we have to manage it. So we can live along with the tuta absoluta. With farming communities locked into a globalized world, threats to crops from new invasive species are slowly becoming the norm. PlantWise now operate in 34 countries, gathering data to form a knowledge bank to track outbreaks and protect smallholders. I catch up with Rajinda at his farm. I want to see what can be done to rescue his devastated crop. Wow. So these are your tomatoes? Yes. They're all completely destroyed. Yeah, yeah, completely destroyed. I um, get money from these crops. It helps to make a uh, uh, family. To support your uh, family? Su family support. How much do you think you've lost with this infestation? How much How money? Much yeah. money, yeah. 20, 30,000, 40%. 40%. Uh, I had also take for some photos uh, in my mobile. Of what can, it used to look yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. Oh, can, can we watch. see? I take this photo from this uh, uh, greenhouse, okay? It's so green and full of tomatoes. Uh, uh, yes. All greens. What a shame. Shiva Beryl, a doctor from Plantwise, has come to show Rajinda how to use this simple trap to manage his tuta absoluta infestation. The trap emits a pheromone that attracts the adult male moth. Soapy water is added to the basin, which the moth then falls into. By reducing the number of males, the population can be controlled without the use of pesticides. How many days until this entire area is treated and until the outbreak is gone? Uh, one month. Uh, one month. One month. How many months until the coming season? Coming just uh, two months. So in two months, he can be fully back in business, yes. growing healthy tomatoes again, yes. just from this simple device. Uh. That's great. How do you feel about that? I'm feel happy. Sir. You're happy? Yeah. Globalization is happening. The world is developing and we can't slow that down. So you can see how an outbreak or a problem in Peru could very well be the same issue for a farmer in Nepal the very next year. And so PlantWise's network of local plant doctors and clinics, supported by an international pest and disease database, enables smallholder farmers to be more prepared in the face of new threats from climate change in an increasingly globalized world. It's going to be a tall order to produce enough food for a growing population as the world's climate changes. But the work has begun. Where weather is extreme, new varieties of crops are being developed and methods to grow them. Where skills are being honed, knowledge is being shared. Food insecurity will become an increasingly pressing issue. But people are finding inventive ways of coping with new conditions.